The film Top Gun was filmed on the F-14 and the F-14 was a star of the film as much as Tom Cruise was. However, for some time there was a real possibility that the F-14 was going to be replaced by the F-15. And not just for the film, but for the whole Navy. At the beginning of the 70s the F-14 was in full development and the Navy was salivating at the thought of his new higher superiority fighter. The aircraft had already shown its potential and the great capabilities provided by the AWG-9 fire control system and the Phoenix missile. At the time, nothing even vaguely similar was available anywhere else in the world. However, despite all this success, one big problem was looming above the program and it was related to its engines. Pratton Whitney TF-30 was one of the most powerful and advanced propulsion unit of its age, but like everything that is advanced, you have to expect some teething problems. And in the case of the TF-30, the problems were quite severe. Turbine blades were failing way too often, and when a turbine blade fails, it is shot at high speed through the engine, and the risk of a fireball is a real one. Moreover, the engine was very sensitive to quick maneuvering and prone to compressor stalls. In the film, Goose Death is a cinematic depiction of this problem. In the film, when the engine suffered a compressor stall, a very high yawing torque was created and the aircraft entered a flat spin, very difficult to recover. In 1971, McDonnell Douglas had already formulated a particular proposal. With the F-15 Eagle close to the first flight, they actually proposed a naval version, the Sea Eagle. Actually, it did not attract particular interest till the problems with the engine started to emerge, and the F-15 was going to soon demonstrate its capabilities, particularly the one of costing 28 millions against the 38 millions for an F-14. So what modifications were proposed by McDonnell Douglas? What does it mean to navalize a modern jet? The marine environment is a salty environment. Salt water is more corrosive than fresh water. When salt gets into solution in water, it splits in two chemicals, none of those electrically neutral, hence more prone to chemical reaction. Yes, because corrosion is just a chemical reaction of the metal with what's available in the environment around it. If bare metal is left exposed and sometimes it's unavoidable to leave the metal exposed, like in the inside of the engines, it will be attacked. Aircraft at the time were made mostly of aluminum, but even aluminum rusts, even though the rust color is not reddish, but is actually whitish. Some alloys are less prone to corrosion and they are those actually used on naval aircraft. Specific isolating primers and paints are used to isolate the metal from the environment to the maximum extent possible. Aircraft on a carrier are regularly cleaned from salt deposits using some impregnated cloth because fresh water is actually scarce on the ship. And sometimes pilots are encouraged to shortly fly through the rain just to wash the aircraft. And fresh water is not the only scarce thing on an aircraft carrier. Aircraft parking space is limited too. And this is the reason why most naval aircraft have folding wings. From a structural perspective, it is not such a big deal as it may seem. It is mostly a matter of correctly dimensioning the junctions of the wing spars. 
Yes, the torsion box will be split in two, but it is not that difficult to build a wing which is still stiff enough and it's not really subject to flutter. What is more complicated is that, that everything that goes through the junction must be foldable as well. This includes fuel pipes, hydraulic pipes, pneumatic pipes, electrical connections, and if they do exist, also the levers that move the aerodynamic surfaces uh, located outboard from the bend. These folding elements are obvious uh, weak points, and them, combined with the junctions and the hinges, actually add weight to the aircraft. The undercarriage of an aircraft landing on an aircraft carrier must withstand loads which are on average higher than those applied to the undercarriage of an aircraft landing on a runway. The vertical speed of an aircraft landing on an aircraft carrier is on average higher than the vertical speed of an aircraft landing to, on a runway with a smooth trajectory. Moreover, the aircraft carrier is usually pitching, so it may well be that the ship goes up when the plane goes down and the two speed combine. The undercarriage of a naval aircraft of the same weight if compared with the undercarriage of a land-based aircraft of roughly the same weight will always be visibly oversized. And no use to say an oversized undercarriage actually adds even more weight to the aircraft. And it's not just the undercarriage, the whole structure of the aircraft need to be dimensioned and designed to withstand the impact. So at this point you can easily imagine that the tail hook is another part of the aircraft which is heavily, heavily stressed. And as usual, it is not just the hook, but is the entire structure around the hook that must be designed to withstand the pull. And since the landing causes a lot of high impulsive or near impulsive loads, the parts that are most stressed at landing are also the most likely to develop metal fatigue. What we said for the main undercarriage is also true for the front wheel that must withstand the launch load imparted from the catapult. Today, we are used to see the front wheel engaging the catapult shuttle with the T-shaped bar, but this wasn't always the case. In the past, aircraft were launched by harnessing them with a bridle connecting the catapult shuttle with a hook in the underbelly of the aircraft. The advantage of this system was that the hook could be placed in a structurally strong position, minimizing the stress of the launch. The flip side was that the bridle often ended up lost at sea, and in the end the T-shaped bar is more efficient and practical for deck operations. As you can see, a cover-based aircraft has important differences with the land-based version. For example, the Rafale C, the single-seater land-based air combat version, has an empty weight of 9,850 kilos. The equally single-seater naval version weighs 10,600 kilos. In general, a carrier-based aircraft weighs more than its land-based equivalent because of the stronger structures and all the additional components. Everything else equal, every extra gram of empty weight is a gram less of payload. And the F-15N was no different. Sources differ, but the estimated weight for the proposed naval version was about 4,000 pounds more than the land-based version. However, despite what happened with the F-4 a few years before, the Navy was not so keen on using an Air Force aircraft. 
They were already heavily invested in the F-14, and the F-15N was just a distraction in their eyes. But, above all, the Navy had a very good reason to stick with the F-14. The F-14 was designed with a specific threat in mind, and that threat was the Soviet Navy. The Soviet Navy was increasingly deploying large and powerful anti-ship missiles, and the most dangerous of those were delivered from the bombers of the Soviet naval aviation. In case of an open confrontation, the main Soviet weapon to disable the aircraft carrier's group would have been a massive incursion of naval bombers. These aircraft, armed with those long-range and supersonic missiles, could easily saturate the defenses of the carrier group, go through the surface-to-air missiles defense, and wreak havoc on an American carrier group. The Navy designed the F-14 exactly for that scenario. Born from the ashes of the TFX program, the F-14 salvaged the best products of that failed effort, the AWG-9 fire control system and the Phoenix missile. These were systems with no equals at the time. They were capable of identifying, tracking and engaging a target at a very long distances, well beyond the range of the surface-to-air missiles. An F-14 could launch up to six Phoenix missiles, each one aimed at an individual target. In this way, a squadron of Tomcats could confront a regiment of Soviet bombers at a very long distance and shoot them down before they reached the missile launch distance. Anyway, this was a unique requisite that was very different from the requisite that gave birth to the Air Force F-15. And in fact, the first proposal for the F-14N actually used the same standard weapons that the Air Force uh, version was using. The Sidewinder missile for short range and the AIM-7 Sparrow for medium range. And there was no doubt that they were no match for the Phoenix. So this was a very good reason to stick to the F-14, but since McDonnell Douglas had actually smelt blood, they didn't let it go very easily. With the support of some element in the US Congress, they went back to the drawing board and came up with a new proposal. The new F-15N had the AWG-9, a second seat and four Phoenix missiles in a semi-conformal installation. And to integrate the Phoenix was also necessary to find the room for the coolant system for the Phoenix, while the F-14 was designed since the beginning with that system in mind. This seemed like a serious challenge, but when the weight was estimated, the new aircraft would have weighted 10,000 pounds more than a standard F-15A. This would have greatly reduced the thrust to weight ratio and the performance in general. But that's not everything, because also the cost, which was the main advantage that the F-15 had against the F-14, was also increased because the F-14 was so expensive, mostly because of its weapons. So this second proposal seemed to be dead in the water, but with the US Congress still looking for savings, McDonnell Douglas came up with a third proposal the F-15 PHNX. The idea was to revert back to a single-seater by modifying the original APG-63 radar of the F-15 to drive the Phoenix missiles. Even this proposal, though, was no match for the Navy requirement. The APG-63 was not even close to the performance of the AWG-9, even though it was a more modern unit. When congressional auditions started in March 1973, the F-15N proposal quickly fell apart. And the Navy, in the end, got the F-14. But there's still one issue open. What if Top Gun was filmed on the F-15. Well, probably if the aircraft was the F-15, there would not have been any accident, any flat spin, Goose would have been still alive and Maverick would not have become the tormented pilot that left the fight in the end of the film. Well, almost left the fight. <laughs> 
So basically, no more drama. Otis, this is a underwhelming final. It is, sir. But you may want to suggest the viewers to watch our videos on the F-14 and the Phoenix. Ah, yes, you, you're right. If you want to understand better why the F-14 and the Phoenix were ideal for the US Navy, please watch the videos that are going to appear beside me. Thank you very much for watching and see you there. Wait, wait, a, wait a second, Otis. What, what do you mean by hours? Good night.